We are recording. Okay, uh, do you want to clap? We're live. We're live. Fuck it, let's do live. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah, first Nailed. try. First try, every try. I think I was telling you before when I was looking at the comments and someone you was like- You read the comments? I, uh, sometimes, but okay. when we do the clap and sometimes we we miss it and we get it wrong and one of the comments gave a tip or oh, we should look at each other's elbow because they thought we were clapping. It's like, no, no, we'd be missing our own hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's, it's the left and the right, not, not him, it's me. It's like, there's a me. full desk between yeah. us. We've just been offbeat completely. <laughs> one, two, three. Uh, 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 shit, I can't get Okay, so hey you and welcome to today's episode of the That Chapter Podcast. I'm once again joined by Keith in a recording studio. First of all, I just want to say sorry for because it's been a big old gap between us posting uh, episodes. So, Thawi! Sorry, man. Yeah, but it's all good now. Yeah. Uh, we're back and we're recording and uh, yeah, episodes will be going up as normal. Keith, yeah. let me ask you, what's going on with you? First of all, yeah. Haunted House. Haunted House. What's going on in the house? No more hauntings. What? But I did have a near-death experience recently. Whoa. In the house. I'm curious. So, do you remember I was telling you that I invented a extreme sport mm-hmm. called wine shower? I know you do love to drink wine in the shower. I thought I do it all the time. I'm like, well, alcoholic. Well, but I mean, you know, sometimes. It just, it started more off. More than, you know. More than the average person. More than I've even done it in my entire life. More than probably most people. Yeah. More, yeah, yeah. It, no, it all just started off because I had a glass or two of wine and I was like, oh shit, I need a shower. And then I jumped in the shower. It's a very fun experience. There's no real rules to it. The one rule is to survive. Survive, yeah, survival survive. is the rule. Yeah. Well, I mean, what would be the rules? Do you have to, are you going to self implement rules like only one glass? You're only allowed to drink red wine. Well, you want to start slow, I guess, you know, okay. and build yourself up to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you'd need bravery to get in there. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, it's, it's an extreme sport. It is an extreme sport. I hear it in, in the Olympics. I believe so. I think they should. It'd be very, very funny. I'd watch it. Who can drink the most bottles of wine and then get into a wet yeah. service where there's porcelain and shit you can <laughs> smack it up? It'd be very, very funny. Oh, oh, man. If, I, if that was like a profession, yeah, I could get yeah. on top of that. But uh, yeah, I had a, had a bit of a slip. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> it looked shocking, you know? It, it wasn't like I didn't fall on the ground, but it was more, you know, one of those fun, those funny, like, cartoony falls, you know, like your feet go... Yeah, 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 yeah. One of those, yeah. Anyway, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, like, spoiler alert, like, I'm, I'm alive. I'm fine. I can see you here. Uh, you do have a couple of bruises. You got a black eye. You've got, like, comical. You came in with crutches, kind of distracted out of the cartoon. Managed to catch myself, thankfully, nice. so I'm okay. But, uh, yeah, probably give it a bit of a break for a while. I think I uh, flew a bit too close to the sun with that. And uh, maybe maybe it needs to be a team sport. You know? I, yeah, you need, you I need, know. like, a partner there I'll to pay. keep an eye on Listen, it. tag me in. Tag me in anyway, yeah, bro. bro. Well, you know, see, the thing is, you said you've had it multiple times, like, had drunken, uh, not drunken, no, <laughs> not saying we're drunk, <laughs> but, you know, wine, shower, uh, multiple times, and this is the first time you had a near that experience in your haunted house. Oh, well, there we go. The ghost is there not happy. Go. Some ghosts push me. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking... So it wasn't me. It wasn't the wine. No, it definitely yeah. wasn't. It, was, the it wasn't my terrible struck, decisions. He struck again. <laughs> <laughs> struck again. My decisions are solid. Yes, exactly. <laughs> wine, Blaine shower's the ghost. fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, well, there you go. That's, uh, we don't really have much to kind of get into, I guess, before we start this tale. It's a good tale. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think, uh, I'm just excited to get into it. It so is. You should get in. It's a long one. Today we're talking about the Mad Trapper of Rat River. This is a story which, um, takes us up into the wilds of the Canadian North. Mm-hmm. If you can believe that, folks. I, I can hear you. I can, I hear Barking Big Dog. The wild, wild North. And it's the story of Albert Johnson. Well, that's believed to be his name. Nobody actually knows his real name. No one even knows his origin. Not a birth date, not a nationality. All we have are guesses and estimates. But Albert Johnson was likely born sometime in the closing decade of the 19th century. After an encounter with RCMP Constable Edgar Millen, who later described Johnson as having what he thought to be a Scandinavian accident, though he couldn't narrow it down anymore and couldn't be certain of that. Nevertheless, it's largely accepted that Albert Johnson was likely of a Scandinavian origin, though it's unknown when he first came to Canada. The only starting point of the story is his meeting with Constable Edgar Millen. So this is a story which begins exactly as I tell it. It begins in medias rest, right? It begins right in the middle. Albert Johnson just showed up one day and the story began. We don't have he was born here, he grew up here, his parents here. Nope, none of that. We're all dogging it. We go straight into it into the like really, really far north of Canada, in the Northwest Territories, which is, it's very Northwest, if you ask me. Show me, I was looking at this on a map. Northwest is inaccurate. It's like right on the Arctic Circle. Yeah, it's like right where the land ends and then it's just like 
ice and glaciers and shit. This is an area that's so vast, it's kind of mind-boggling how big and open it is. So for where the story takes place, if you're looking at it, like, it's kind of hard to say where it takes place because you really do have to look at a map to say this is where the story takes place. Like there's no, it's near this city or it's near that. It took me a while to find out because I tried to find, it's obviously the uh, on Rat River. I tried to find Rat River. It's, it was hard to find. There's a couple the of Rat maps. Rivers as well, which really kind of confused is, me. That was it, yeah. yeah. yeah, I was yeah. Looking, at the start, I was looking at the complete wrong place. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it took me a while to find it. But then when I did find it, I on Google Maps, you know, you can change it to see the actual landscape. Of it. Yeah, yeah. Holy shit, man. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was one of those ones where I Google had to zoom out and keep zooming out to find out where this actually is. So if you're looking at Canada, if you're looking at a map of Canada, go close to the border with Alaska and in like the midway point of the border, uh, it's Yukon. And it's the story set around there. It's fr a frozen nowhere, essentially. Very, very beautiful, but kind of scary and how big and empty it is. So what we know is that Johnson, Albert Johnson, our protagonist or, well... Antagonist? Yeah. Antagonist. Antagonist. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. he's definitely not a hero. Asshole. Yeah, <laughs> shitbag. <laughs> yeah. Our shithead. <laughs> he arrived at Fort McPherson after coming in down the Peel River on July 9th, 1931. Other than having an accent, Scandinavian, as Millen described, he was also described as being clean shaven and having more than enough money on hand to pay for supplies. Rough going out there. He had to recharge, you know, his iPad. He had to get his little hand warmers on, all that kind of stuff. Get a quick fix of poutine. Canada's national contribution to world food, and it's pretty good. I love poutine. Oh man, it's good. It's good shit. It's good when, shit. When uh, when Millen when he approached Johnson uh, first, so his intention was simply just to check on him, just inquire if you know you all right, while also like trying to understand whether Johnson was like aware of the challenges he might encounter while up in the northern wilderness, because it's no joke. The encounter, like it was civil, but Johnson, like he immediately just went into defensive mode, really expressing his desire to have like no involvement with the police at all. So straight away, his response raised some suspicions with Millen. Uh, he definitely wasn't a people person. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You'll see just exactly how un of a people person he was. So after stopping briefly at McPherson, just long enough to stock up on supplies before heading out and setting out to traverse the waterways of the Mackenzie River Delta, we're saying all these names of these places, but if you have no frame of reference, this is just wild, wild nowhere. As far away from civilization as you could possibly get. He used a handmade raft that was actually made by the indigenous people, uh, the First Nations people in the area, essentially similar to a canoe. Might have been a, a moose skin boat. Might have been. That would keep you nice and dry. Keep your boat nice and dry. The natives, they actually used to make, uh, so they used to make the frame out of spruce because it was nice mm. and malleable and they yeah. could bend it. And then they, so, and then uh, they'd cover it with moose skin. How metal is that? That's pretty cool. Isn't yeah, it? skinning a moose and then putting it on your boat. What would you even put on your boat though? Like, I think, I, I think they... Put on yourself. <laughs> yeah, yourself <laughs> yeah. Freezing it. Yeah. I think it was made, like it was more of a one trip boat type oh, deal. okay. Like they used to shoot the moose then they'd skill, they'd skin it yeah. and then they also needed to trade the, the pelt and yeah, yeah. at these trading posts. Ah, so so they'd, take it off the boat? Yeah, they'd make the canoe out of Ah, out of the skin, right. sail it down, dismantle the boat, give him the pelt. Ah, and okay. then I guess they're kind of scuppered down. Yeah, like, so how do I get back? <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, I guess we're walking. Yeah. <laughs> Which is exactly what we said it to a point. <laughs> so Johnson eventually settled on the banks of the Rat River and even built himself a small cabin, which was about 8 foot by 10 foot, roughly 2.5 meters by 3 meters. At the time, which is the early 1930s, it wasn't all that uncommon for outsiders and former, you know, big townies to come out and settle around the Yukon and those much more rural, and rural, I mean rural, rural areas. Many were fleeing the Great Depression and the economic desperation that had been brought upon millions. And as always, you know, is the case again and again throughout history, people trying to escape hardships, poverty, war, uh, not really too welcome. They're like, mm, don't bring that shit over here. We're, we're, kinda, we're kinda good. They're often seen as invaders. And it seems that was likely the case here with Albert Johnson. But truly how he ended up here remains a mystery. Did he flee the depression of the southern areas of Canada or America? Did he come directly from Europe? Whom knows? Do you? Not me, man. Okay, well, then neither do I. <laughs> the native people around Fort McPherson and Rat River relied heavily on their ability to set traps to catch animals. Primarily, and more often, the animals caught were used for their furs and, you know, it was often used to supplement meat. Yeah, like the types of animals they were catching were like beaver, mm. muskrat, uh, otter, mink, fox. Mm, delicious. Not a, All <laughs> of which are delicious. Not, not, not a huge, it's more of an aperitif. Yeah, like, yeah. Not a huge amount of meat on them. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. They're good money to be made with the fur. Like there is, yeah. the type of meat to be hunting for food would be like a fish and moose. And there was um, caribou and the doll sheep is something used to hunt up there. Doll sheep? Yeah. It's, it's Never remember that. Badass looking. It's really cool. 
uh, if you want to look, it's basically it's a sheep with like big, huge fucking horns. Like they're nice. massive. Yeah. Like do you know like uh, what you picture like the devil goat? Oh, yeah, that's cool as fuck. But in sheep form. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's even better. Yeah. So it's cuddly too. <laughs> it'll cuddly, but it'll, it'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll get you. So, unsurprisingly, the native peoples, they took it very seriously when anyone messed with their traps. If you interfered with someone else's trap, you're literally reducing their chances of survival and how hard the coming months would be for them. And that is what several locals were complaining about shortly before Christmas of 1931. Not only were they accusing Albert Johnson of destroying their traps, occasionally leaving them hanging from trees for the owner to discover during their next inspection, they were also accusing him of trapping without a license. Now, exactly why Albert didn't have a trapper's license is unknown. Alpha male, quite like myself, didn't need one. I I relate to Albert Johnson. I can go out (laughs) trapping. I just choose not to. But it was certainly unusual for anyone living in that kind of isolation and not to trap for survival. And so almost everyone was expected to have a license. You got to fill out the fucking paperwork. Even 1930s, fuck paperwork, Jesus. I get the feeling this man does not care for the law. No, like I said, he's an alpha like me. You've never seen anything like me. I am the Alpha of Alphas. Alphas, <laughs> alphas respect Alphas. Exactly. Yeah. The, uh, I wonder if um, I seen some theories of because it looked like he just went out and destroyed the traps for some reason. But I'd wonder if he just he was so bad at trapping himself, or he just didn't bring any equipment to trap. It was like he was going out and stealing the meat from the traps mm-hmm. and then leaving the traps. Yeah, it's just, just setting them back up again. Yeah, mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Yoink>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's classic. I mean, whether or not the allegations are even true, um, that's up for debate, but they were considered serious enough for police constables to consider paying Albert a visit. The locals had suggested to the RCMP that Albert might have lost his mind living in such harsh conditions and extreme isolation. Thing is, it's likely that all, or at least most, of the accusations leveled against Albert were made up, or likely that locals were just pissed off about having yet another stranger coming into their area, once another burden on the already thinly stretched resources, just they didn't like new people coming in. A police report, written later, said that it was actually Albert Johnson's simple desire to be left alone to his own devices that kicked off the hostility between him and the locals. The report alleged that Johnson had been visited at his cabin by several of the natives, who he then told to go back to where they came from, which, I mean, he's in their lands. Go over there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Go over by that tree where you came from. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I am up. That was good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Only it's very likely he used far less diplomatic language and might have even brandished a gun at his visitors because we will get to it, but he liked to brandish his guns. But point is, Albert Johnson really, really, really just wanted to be left alone. He was like the ultimate introvert, to the point where he'll actually kill quite a few people to be introverted. The day after Christmas, 1931, two constables from the RCMP at Aklavik, which is a tiny town, 60 miles to the north of Johnson's cabin, they made the journey down the Rat River to talk to Johnson about what was happening and basically just trying to you know, settle things before they had a chance to escalate. Settle this trapping stuff, was he stealing traps, was he destroying them, whatever. They arrived two days later on the 28th of December, and Constable King and Special Constable Bernard approached Johnson's cabin with caution. The two officers had considerable experience with the harsh climate of the Northern Territories and the often hostile people who lived there. They knew to tread lightly, and after seeing smoke coming from the chimney, they knew Albert must be home. Very astute. Mmm, smoke coming from the It's a head scratcher. I've cracked it. No. <laughs> And so they did their best to get his attention without scaring him or spooking him. Though they knew he was inside, the constables at first, they knock, knock, knock and received no response. Finally, in an effort to get him to acknowledge their presence that they were there to speak to him, King peered through a window, at which point Albert covered the window with an empty sack and continued to just go about his business like they weren't there. Ain't nobody home and there never was! (laughs) I cannot say what he was acting, it was crazy. Not having radios or any way to communicate with the Aklavik outpost, the two officers decided they'd, ah, well, run out of options. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we tried knocking, what do we, we tried, do? Yeah. yeah, we tried knocking, we tried looking in the window, he's ignoring us, okay. <laughs> so then they went back to get a search warrant and maybe a couple other officers to give him a hand. The officers then returned with double the number of their original visit, with Constable McDowell and Special Constable, uh, one second, City Chinley? That's his name, right? Because I have been researching this and read it, but I've never actually said it out loud. It's um, a funny name, City Chinley. Si- yeah, sounds right. Yeah, that sounds very right. On the 31st of December, warrant in hand. Once again, the officers got the same silent treatment from Albert Johnson they'd received a couple of days earlier. 
This time, when Johnson continued to ignore the men and their questions and went inside his cabin, King decided he'd have enough of this faffing about and he looked to force entry through the door. He picked up an axe as he walked towards the front door. Johnson was ready and waiting on the other side of the door, however, and King didn't even get the door open an inch before Johnson fired a round straight through the door. King took it in the chest and he dropped to the floor, causing the other three men to run for cover, at which point a ferocious firefight broke out. And it was really a miracle that somehow no one else was hit. In fairness, he came at him with an axe. Did come at him with an axe. I mean, come on, he just wants to be left alone. You're trying to axe his door. Fucking blow him yeah. away! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even more extraordinary was that the officers managed to suppress Johnson's fire for long enough to drag the seriously wounded King to safety. With one Mountie injured and Albert Johnson being well and truly dug in, the officers quickly abandoned any ideas of taking Johnson into custody and the main objective was getting King back to hospital and regrouping at Aklavik. Despite the chaos and the minus 42 degree weather, they were able to keep King stable for the 60 mile journey back, where he later made a full recovery. What a mess. Like, it, was such, yeah. it was such a benign issue to begin with. Like, the RCMP, they had no proof that he was messing with traps. So if Johnson had just opened the door initially, I'm sure this all could have been settled over yeah. a nice cup of tea. Now then, who's for tea? Doesn't end that way, my friend. And what do you say to a cup? Take off, cup! <laughs> he loves his cup of tea. Take off! In response to the shooting of King, almost the entire complement of Mounties stationed at Aklavik emptied out and set off in the direction of Albert Johnson's cabin. The chief boyo, Eames was his name, he knew they were going to need plenty of men, or at least enough to make sure they had Johnson surrounded, perhaps if they you know, could get his cabin surrounded, he'd come to his senses. Regardless, they were taking no chances and were not going to underestimate Johnson's desire to be left alone at this time. One of the men who even joined the posse was none other than Constable Millen, who had spoken to Johnson a couple of weeks before back at Fort McPherson, actually a couple of months before. In fact, he's the only person to believe to have ever heard Johnson speak. And so, they finally set off on January 3rd, 1932. In total, nine men, eight part of the posse to take Johnson into custody and a guide to get them there. And it took 42 men for, and it took, oh man, it took 42 dogs to carry the men, their equipment and the supplies necessary to remove Johnson. The eight men were sufficiently concerned about Johnson, and they took not only with them their rifles, but a contingency plan also. Dynamite! Almost 10 kilos were packed up, just in case they couldn't persuade Johnson out. Still persuade him pretty good. I, like, I'm sure when they were packing up all the stuff, they were saying, there's no way in hell we're going to need all it is for yeah. one man. Also, like, this story is starting to sound a little bit like Rambo. Rambo or that, um, that Charles Bronson movie? What's that one where he's, like, alone? Death Hunt. Sounds a lot like... Oh, it actually... Oh, fuck. That actually... That, that is movie's actually... That is this yeah. movie. It's based on this story. Okay, that makes a lot more sense now. Okay. Because I'd seen bits of this movie before. And yeah, it's... Okay, it's literally based on the story. Charles Bronson plays Albert Johnson. I seen a, a trailer for that, for that movie about Death Hunt when I was looking it up. And it's such... I think it was uh, in the 80s when it was done. Yeah. I mean, uh, 81. 81. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I said I had Charles Bronson as Albert Johnson and Lee Marvin as... Sergeant Edgar Millen. Yeah. But uh, d this is an actual line from the trailer. It's like, they fight for the same cause. They live by the same code. But now, the law has made them enemies. Death Hunt. Oh, <laughs> oh, I like it. That's pretty good. That's cool. I like that. By this point, many of the men and Chief Eames himself were speculating about why Albert was so keen not to talk to him or anybody, it seemed. One line of thinking was that Johnson had, quote, gone bush popular slang in the Northern Territory for anyone who, who had had the pressure of living in such extreme isolation go to her head, essentially just going crazy, living out there by yourself. In fact, that's one of the main reasons that Johnson had been uh, considered so unusual to the locals. The people of Rat River and the surrounding area often relied, you know, on stopping in at strangers' cabins uh, for refreshments, but more importantly, just the company. To just, you need to have to talk to, like, you have to talk to somebody. Inhabitants, you know, going long spells without talking to people will, well, yeah, it will drive you insane. And that's what it was believed happened to Albert Johnson. The issue of isolation really was, it was a regular occurrence. There was a quote from a book I was reading uh, about the RCMP that said, nearly every month uh, we have to send out a patrol consisting of two men and a dog team to fetch some poor chap who has gone bush crazy. 
push crazy there you so go. like it really is like it's easy to see how someone could lose their mind due to like extreme isolation yeah there was a, a this infamous sensory deprivation experiments uh, during the mid 20th century like the 50s 60s um it was when there was rumors of china using solitary confinement to brainwash american prisoners during the korean war so naturally the u.s and canadian governments they were eager to investigate the effects give it a go so they conducted some studies um, recruited paid volunteers, uh, primarily college students, trying to get a bit more beer money, I guess. <laughs> uh, the plan was to isolate them for days, even weeks, in soundproof cubicles, depriving them of, of any meaningful human interaction. But like within just a few hours of the isolation, the students, they began to exhibit acute restlessness and started to experience uh, hallucinations. And the uh, hallucinations, they started like simple, like simple points of light, uh, lines, or just like seeing shapes, but that rapidly involved wow. into bizarre and surreal scenes. Some volunteers, they reported seeing squirrels marching with sacks on their shoulders. Wow. Others Jeez. envisioned dogs just running around. Yeah. Um, strangely, the sound hallucinations, they also manifested. So some heard uh, music boxes or choirs. And in some cases, participants even imagined sensations of touch. One individual um, said it felt as though he was being hit in the arm by pellets, like shot from a BB gun. But like, as I mentioned, like initially, the researchers, they had planned to observe the subjects over the course of several weeks. But mm. the trial had to be terminated prematurely. The participants, they just became too distressed to right, continue. They, started going, they went too crazy. Too crazy, yeah. And most of them, they lasted no more than two days, uh, none enduring uh, longer than a week in isolation. But, wow. like, of course, like, this is, it's an extreme example of yeah. isolation where, like, all sensory stimulation was removed. But, it, like, in the case of Albert Johnson, even though he lacked human contact, the, I guess, like, the surrounding landscape could act as a substitute for stimulation. What do you do? Snow and mountains and trees. Like, yeah, well, I guess kind of, you know, keep you busy. No, bu- busy work. You that's know? true. Go on, I, I, go I, 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 you can't, you can't bait an old cup of tea and a nice chat. You that's know what I mean? It, that's you, need, it, yeah. you need a, a bit of a chin wag every that's now and then. It, uh, yeah. But like, there still is like, there's numerous examples of solo explorers, mountaineers losing their way and succumbing to insanity as a result of loneliness. There was one example, um, Donald Crowhurst. He was an amateur sailor. He vanished while participating in a around the world yacht race. Uh, he ended up sending reports about his alleged process through the southern seas, but in reality, he never departed from the Atlantic. Oh. So he was adrift for months near the coast. Just like fucking inventing all this mad shit. He was just sending off so saying he was somewhere else and yeah. he was nowhere near it. He was just, he was down to South America. He just sank deeper into depression and loneliness and then he even retreated to his cabin. Um, he just fell into these elaborate fantasies. He expressed them all in this sprawling 25,000 word manuscript. Wow. Before, tragically, he just took his own life. He jumped overboard. The body was never found. Oh my God. And maybe like Albert Johnson, he may have truly enjoyed the solitude, but like us humans, like we are, we're social creatures at heart. So I don't know if, if someone genuine, if, if they're genuinely happy to be completely isolated, maybe they're like a tad bit cracked to begin with. Yeah, I think. What do you think is the longest you could go without like talking to anybody like are you are you pretty would you say you're a pretty social person or like you know extrovert or introvert or whatever yeah i'd say, I'd say i'm pretty social mm. like it's nice to have alone time mm. but i even find because i work from home and sometimes uh like family to be, be out for the day and i'd be alone all day if i haven't got any if i don't have any zoom calls or whatever yeah they come back and I haven't talked to him for the whole day. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, like you're going crazy. Him, yeah. Shite, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get that. I get that. that's fair. That's fair. I think I'm a pretty introverted. I'd say I'm naturally an introverted person, but I'm one of those people. I get energy off other people. Yeah. Like some people, they'd be introverted and they find other people drain them. Hmm. Like if they're at a party, they just feel exhausted just from talking to people. I feel like I'm the opposite. I feel like I get energy from talking to people. But uh, like I'd be like, oh, I don't want to go. But then as soon as I'm there, I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> you know? But uh, anyway, so that's Albert Johnson. Did he go bush? Hey, listen, I'd like so I'd like to get some bush myself. You know Wee. what I'm saying? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> We're all having fun. Lads, lads, lads. <laughs> lads, lads, lads. <laughs> Albert Johnson, what a look. <laughs> all right. So the weather, by the way, was classic awful. alpha. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the alpha male is like like us and Albert Johnson, bros. We should have him on the pod. <laughs> so the weather was awful. <sighs> Like that awful. Nice. Ooh, that's, that's I'm so adding bad. in sound effects. I could have added them in post, but you know, it's more fun if I just do it myself. The weather was awful. Uh, burr, burr. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> get it? But, uh, but Eames and his men, they arrived at the Johnson cabin. And despite being fully aware he'd be getting a visit from the Mounties for shooting a, a friggin' Mountie or CMP officer, Officer King, Johnson said, hells no. He was waiting for him. Big shit eating grin. He was like, come and get me. I'll either kill you. Got themselves killed trying. 
You can't stop it. Hell yeah, dude. He rules, actually. The more I read the story and the more I read it, I'm like, Oliver Johnson was fucking cool. <laughs> Scouts sent ahead reported that Johnson was holed up and, as before, had covered all the windows in his small cabin. Now, because of the arduous journey getting there, the posse had gotten lost and had to use far more of their supplies much earlier than they expected to. That meant that Eames knew going into the confrontation that his team didn't have the necessary supplies to wait out Johnson. They needed to end things mucho rapido. Like, they had a guide, Charlie, and it's easy to blame Charlie uh, why he got lost. But there was also Constable uh, Robert McDowell. He was part of his posse as well. And this was his second time yeah. going to the cabin. He'd been there before yeah. and still got lost. Yeah. Well, again, you know, this area is really, really, really big and full of, like, nothing. I imagine it's very easy to get lost there. Although I do blame the guide because it's literally in your name. <laughs> That's it, literally your job. You had one job. Yeah. And they were, they were lost for two days. Yeah, yeah. Like, it wasn't no, just sure. quick. I'm not sure where we are. They, were, they got fully lost for two days, had to trek back until they recognized something and then set off Recognize again. Recognize them, they rock. So they the trekked tra- back yeah. and then off again. And this is all in, like, minus 40 degree weather. Yeah, Freeze. yeah. So remember, um, the cabin was beside a river, and so the posse used the river bank, Rat River Bank, as cover to encircle the cabin. Once his men were in place, Inspector Eames shouted out to Johnson to give up his weapons and come out. He used the opportunity to tell Johnson that the officer he had shot had survived and was still alive, insisting that they were going to arrest him, but not for murder, he wouldn't face the noose. Eames received a curt, uh, silence. And under the pressure of time and short supplies, they decided they needed to force the door open and rush Johnson. Without the element of surprise, however, it was a risky proposition. I bet he was regretting shouting at him now. To provide a distraction, two of the posse broke away from the main group and rushed the door, as three more of the posse remained behind the protection of the riverbank and fired, hoping to distract Johnson as the two others approached. Eames and the rest of his men had managed to creep around the cabin, and had taken up positions overlooking the cabin to make sure Johnson couldn't slip away out back. What they didn't know was that Johnson had been preparing for this situation since they had been there last time, and he had made himself several holes, one on each side of the cabin, and he would move between each hole, firing in every direction, while shielded from the constable's rifle shots. With the cabin being only 10 foot by 8 foot in total, Johnson was easily able to move back and forth letting out suppressing fire in every direction. He had a clear view of them. They couldn't see shit of him. The two officers who approached were confused by this whole situation. They had no idea where these shots were coming from. And it appeared that Johnson must have been firing from a prone on his belly position. He was lying down on the floor of the cabin on his belly. Despite the incoming fire, the two officers made it to the cabin unharmed and had taken up positions on each side of the door. Then, what they did was, between every shot Johnson let out, they would take it in turns to run across the door, and as they passed, they would swing at the door with the butt of their rifle. Run across, swing, you're to go run across, swing. They kept on doing this, hoping to break through. All the time, the surrounding constables let off round after round into the cabin in hopes of hitting Johnson, or at least putting him down so that he couldn't move freely. What they didn't know was just how prepared Johnson was for this siege. He had spent the previous days digging a deep hole in the floor of the cabin and made holes in the logs at the base of the cabin. He essentially turned his own cabin into a fortress that they had no idea. So imagine there's holes in the sides of the cabin where he can shoot out of. And then the ground floor of the cabin is dug up. Essentially a trench. Essentially he has a trench. He's turned the entire cabin into a trench. The cabin wall is blocking him. The logs were packed with dirt and earth, so he could literally stay there, like they're not going to get him. You would not be able to shoot him, and he was able to to return fire in every direction. Because it was minus 40 degrees, the dirt that he'd packed between the two logs uh, for the walls, they would have become rock hard like concrete as well. Mm. So yeah, I said like it's really impressive. He really built himself a very oh, impressive he, little fort. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, one of the guys who had joined the posse and managed to pry open the door, but Johnson was quick to react, and he dual wielded pistols like a badass and said, pow, 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 open, open a fire on them. Now the men surrounding the cabin could see exactly why they'd been unable to hit Johnson despite the hundreds of rounds they'd fired off. Johnson was literally dug in and could dip down into his trench whenever fire was coming his way. Not only did the door not help them get inside, 
as the only entrance, it gave Johnson what was essentially just a big large hole for him to fire out of, but firing in would do nothing. Eames and his men were forced back by a combination of Johnson's advantageous position and the extremely brutal weather. It had fallen to around minus 42 degrees and they were all feeling it. That and the lack of sleep, the rest made a prolonged attack untenable. And so the posse set up a small camp not far away from the cabin to be safe from fire from Johnson's guns, but close enough to keep an eye on him. This part of the story is intense. Oh, it is. Very, because very, they're camping. Yeah, they're camping. They're <laughs> intense. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but like, seriously, like, it actually would have been like very intense. Like They would have been exhausted, but then also you're not really getting any sleep because you're sleeping on the doorstep of a madman. But I'd be sleeping with both eyes open. Oh, I would be. I wouldn't be sleeping at all. Very good. So they're in... <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Yep. Good input. Shitty pun. <laughs> <laughs> so at around 9pm that night, Eames decided there was no point in continuing to just throw volley after volley at Johnson. He ordered the men to thaw out the dynamite, which, uh, to do that, you essentially have to stick dynamite basically down your fucking jacks, like, warm it up with your ass next to your skin to, hoping to, you know, warm it up enough so that it will actually ignite and explode. It's definitely, like, a risky job. Heat up this dynamite, but... Not too much. Just a little bit. Okay, so just stick it down next to your balls. I just hope <laughs> yeah. that will warm it up, but you know, not, not that one. Just be careful. They continued to exchange gunfire with Johnson, but this time they began to throw the semi-thawed sticks of dynamite into the cabin, hoping to maybe create some openings in the logs protecting Johnson, rather than killing him outright with an explosion. Though, I mean, you gotta admit that's a distinct possibility. You probably will kill him throwing dynamite into his very small cabin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although, this is where Johnson got lucky. The dynamite had by no means thawed out. Uh, it was still semi-frozen, so it was essentially, like, like nothing. A little firecracker. A little firecracker. Yeah, that's exactly it. Some of the sticks didn't even ignite. Now, whether that was because they were frozen or Johnson simply had enough time to put it out, to, like, pull out the fuse or whatever, it was unknown. But essentially, the biggest weapon they had went nowhere. By the early hours of the 10th of January... Eames and his men were physically and mentally exhausted. Not only had they gone through the stretched out trek to get there after being lost for two days in the harshest of conditions, they had now spent the better part of a day engaged in a gunfight. Things were getting desperate, and Johnson appeared to have an entire armory down there in his little hole. Eames, perhaps out of frustration, took the last four pounds of dynamite, tied it together. He then whoop, hoy the lip bowl onto the roof of the cabin, braced himself, crossing his fingers. The resulting blast was actually pretty big and partially collapsed the roof down upon the cabin. They rushed it, but again, Johnson had expected them and opened fire dual-wielding pistols as they approached. What a hero. He was pretty cool. Dual-wielding pistols, but he was like jumping in slow motion, yeah, doing yeah, all yeah. that like Matrix style. How is he doing that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, slow yeah, motion. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> After over 15 hours in minus 40 degree weather and hundreds of rounds exchanged, no one had been injured, let alone killed. When they were, so before when they were retreating back um, after they threw the dime on the roof and all uh, caved in on stuff, they heard Johnson just laughing like a madman <laughs> from within like this collapsed like and smoking them. cabin. Honestly, this is like straight out of a movie. He's like, you fucking losers. Yeah, he's just like, ah, you bastards. I always wanted an open plan. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> So these guys had fired literally hundreds of rounds and thrown a considerable amount of explosives and it did nothing to get him out of his little cabin. How determined Albert Johnson was, I'm wondering, did he do it or did he not do it? Part of me thinks he probably didn't do it. He probably just didn't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if he did do it, it just feels like one of those things where you would admit doing it. Like, I feel like he was so defensive and held up in his position for so long that he, I don't know, that he, it just doesn't seem like he did it because he was so defensive. He probably just thought they were coming to kill him or something like that. Right, yeah, yeah. Like, rather than him, like, he, it feels like to me he didn't think they had a reason to be doing what they're doing. He probably, yeah, his mind didn't go to, oh, this is because of the traps. Yeah. It was like, shit, these people are after me to kill me. Yeah, for whatever exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I mean, we'll get to it later on. We'll talk about, you know, theorize where he could have been. And this kind of, I still think he was probably a soldier. 
at some point in World War One. Maybe he had PTSD and was just, you know, going crazy. He, he built a trench. He knew how to fire off a lot of guns. He knew how to construct defenses, build trenches, dig trenches in his cabin. He's well fortified. So he's clearly, like, I mean, if he wasn't the soldier, like, who do, I wouldn't fucking know to do that shit. I know. You know what I mean? <laughs> give like, it a go. Bro. Yeah, yeah, give it a go. I wouldn't be able to fucking do it. I'd be like, I'd do it for like a, like an hour and be like, oh, this is fucking exhausting. <laughs> I'd be dead in a week. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I just definitely... curled up in the mound of dirt. Yeah, like... I'd be like, oh, just, just kill me now. Um, so that's why I did definitely think he was probably a soldier uh, in some He had the skills, thing. anyway. Yeah. Definitely had the skills. Maybe he had like PTSD. He was like, I'm back in the war. Maybe he's having a great time. Maybe this is what he wanted. You know, you hear about those guys who just love war so much yeah, that yeah. they're like, they want to back in the yeah, shit. Yeah. Maybe he was like that. He's like, that's just fucking great. Like, he's having a great time. <laughs> yeah, he's he's laughing. Life. You said he, he was laughing. He, he was laughing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's brilliant. This is exactly what I wanted. Yeah. yeah. Even with his cabin crumbling and smoking in ruins around him, Johnson's resolve had not waned, and he continued to defy the order to surrender. With themselves and their supplies nearly completely exhausted, at around 4 a.m., Eames, the chief here, chief of the RCMP, he swallowed his bride and he called his men off. As hard as it was to leave, knowing Johnson was still there, Eames knew he had to put the safety of his men and himself over any pride they'd lose. He who runs away can live to fight another day. Coward's motto. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I say. I'll just run away. <laughs> I'll be back. They arrived back in Aklavik on the 12th of January after over a week in sub-40 weather and days on days without sleep. After some much-needed rest, Eames and his men calculated that Johnson had faced the better part of over 700 rounds of ammunition, as well as 20 pounds of dynamite, and that did not fucking get him out of there. Some man for one man. He had some amount of ammunition himself. Oh, like this yeah. Tiny cabin. Like, it was, yeah. what was it, 8 foot by 10 foot? Mm-hmm. This must be just wall-to-wall guns and ammunition. You know what he's like? Did you ever see the movie Tremors? Yes. You know the couple who uh, live in the basement? Yeah. Oh, and they have all the guns? Yeah, yeah. That's what he was like. They were like, remember, really excited. They were like, yeah. it's like Vietnam all over yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> I guarantee you that's what Albert Johnson was like. We should watch the movie again soon. That Tremors a is a fucking great movie. That's a good movie, yeah. Yeah. Actually, just pause this. We're just going to watch a quick movie. Yeah, we'll yeah, be, yeah. Back. be right back. Be right back. <laughs> All right, Tremors is great. We're back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Tremors is great. Watch it. Watch that, lads. If you haven't watched it, watch it. Do you know what I love about Tremors is... Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to watch it again. Talk about, guys, this is the Tremors podcast <laughs> yeah. now. We're going to talk about Tremors. Yeah, and all Tremor fans. Yeah. But one of the reasons I love Tremors so much, besides it being a great movie, is that um, you know the way when you're in school, hmm. like uh, in secondary school or high school or whatever, the way if ever there was a teacher sick, It'd always bring in, you know, they wheel in the TV. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There'd always be one movie. For me, it was Tremors. They would always show Tremors for some reason. Really? Even though we went to the same school. Yeah, yeah. They would always show Tremors. So my my mom was a teacher in the school and we had Tremors on VHS. And I think she must have brought it into the school one day. <laughs> Taught us something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I thought it was like education. Yeah. yeah. So it would always be a movie they would put on. That's and I was like, fuck, this yeah. is great, lads. I love it. <laughs> Fond memories. Yeah. yeah. I'm a real tremor head. What was the worm's name? <laughs> ah, it was um, Graboids. The Graboids. That's what I like. Graboid. That's it. Graboid. So anyway, okay, I suppose we should talk about Alder Johnson a bit more. Because, folks, we are not even nearly done with his story. It gets crazier and crazier as the story goes on. Albert Johnson just wanted to be left alone. And so Johnson was thinking to himself at this point, I mean, I presume he's thinking to himself at this point, let's put ourselves in his position. Well, if I was him, I'd be thinking, if you can make it the 320 kilometers to the Alaskan border, you'd be out of Canadian jurisdiction, and then he could be alone in Alaska, right? And with someone as hardy as Johnson, that wasn't an impossible task. After the posse returned empty-handed, news of the fleeing madman quickly broke. Reports of Johnson's shootout with the constables were out on the Aklavik radio waves, and the Calgary Daily Herald had Johnson splashed across the front page. Johnson's name appeared everywhere next to some variation of maniac or madman. Eames made efforts to keep tabs on Johnson's whereabouts while he raised a new posse to pursue him, this time across open country. On January 14th, under orders from Eames, Two men returned to Johnson's cabin to keep an eye on him. However, just like the news was saying, when they got there, they found the cabin deserted and Johnson was long gone. The men searched the cabin. Not only was there no sign of his origin or identity, they couldn't even find the shell casings Johnson had spent in the firefight. 
fair play to him. He was clean. Yeah. Say what you want about Johnson, but he was very environmentally conscious. Yes. Yeah. No littering. He wanted to leave this beautiful Canadian wilderness as bleak and empty as he had found it. Meanwhile, Ames was building his new posse. This time, importantly, they'd be joined by two soldiers who'd be able to provide radio equipment and keep them in touch with the radio service back in Aklavik. This had never been done before, and so Eames and eight men met up not far from Johnson's cabin on the 16th of January. With the new posse ready, they set out in pursuit of the fugitive. Ooh. And we will pick up in part two of the Mad Trapper of Rat River. Yes. <laughs> Johnson should have joined the posse. That's the last place to go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking for it myself. <laughs> this is actually uh, some, something similar like that actually did happen. A woman went missing on her holiday in Iceland. Uh, she accidentally joined her own search party. <laughs> so she left briefly to change clothes. She went yeah. to the bathroom to change her clothes. And when she got back, her fellow tourists they didn't recognize her when she oh, returned. Really? Yeah, so a, per- so a search funny. party was, was organized. The Coast Guard got involved. They were notified. It was only at 3 a.m. the next morning that they realized that she was in the search <laughs> party. She said, oh, who are we looking for? Myself. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying Johnson just he should have done that but um yeah it's pretty cool dude yeah, Johnson man. I think he's a badass very badass the story will get even crazier in the next one folks when part two it's a race across open country it's the hunt and they have to catch him before he reaches Alaska will the Mounties get their man ooh do the, isn't the Mounties always get their man this, this is where it comes from Oh, yeah. spoiler alert. Oh, I'm sorry. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I probably should have. Sorry. Erase that. Okay, you guys, you, he, you did not hear that. <laughs> when he says it, next episode, act surprised. <laughs> 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 All right. Here, um, yeah, here, listen, let's wrap up this old one. Uh, here, Keith, thanks for joining me for another episode of the That Chapter podcast. Folks, thank you so much for listening. You guys are great. And yeah, listen. Yeah, always a pleasure. See, thanks, you, man. see you real soon. Thanks so much for listening, guys. And I love you. Mike out. See ya. Bye. <laughs> that was really good. That was good. Really good. We did it. We did it. We faced temptation and did not fear. Goddamn praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs>